Hello and welcome to the New World Review, your source for everything anime and manga. And today it's time for some more JoJo talk, quite specifically in regards to my thoughts on part four, Diamond is Unbreakable. And I thought I'd do this because pretty much every second comment on the video discussing parts one through three was singing the praises of part four and five to no end. And well, in the case of Diamond is Unbreakable, I have to say that, uh, well, you were all pretty damn correct. I think part four is extremely solid in almost every single way, effectively addressing all of my major complaints about Stardust Crusaders by once again, radically changing the format of the series. Diamond is Unbreakable adopts a more slice of life style of storytelling, which works super, super well with Araki's desire to maintain a sort of stand of the week idea. And the reason why that didn't work for me so much in part three is because the stakes were so damn high right from the get-go. Jotaro and the gang were on a time sensitive mission to defeat the ultimate evil Dio dude, or else Holly was going to die. That was the overtone of the entire series. So getting bogged down in monster of the week stuff, as well as just general shenanigans of the main cast, always felt at odds with the tone that part three had set up. But in part four, no problems whatsoever, because the slice of life genre allows your shorter stories to be more casual and not necessarily feel like they need to contribute to a greater narrative. For example, I think one of the episodes that I had the most fun in was when Josuke and Okiyasu went to Tonio's restaurant for the first time, and the entire story was just experimenting with the the idea of mixing a stand with food, as well as some villainous misdirection, but it really was a nice chillaxed experience. Whereas if an episode like this were to appear in Stardust Crusaders, I would have come out of it thinking that it was a massive waste of time because we really cannot afford to be taking detours like that. But detours really is the name of the game in Diamond is Unbreakable and it just works so much better. And there was never a time where I was not happy to go along with whatever crazy event was happening, be it dramatic, comedic, or just plain weird. And there's a, there's a lot of just plain weird. But moving to our new protagonist, I generally like Josuke quite a lot. He had a lot more personality equipped than the quiet Jotaro, or the rather stiff Jonathan. So it harks back to more of a young Joseph Joestar kind of feel, which I really appreciate about him. He has an incredible set of quirks, the most potent of which being his sensitivity in regards to his hair, which even comes to be nicely dramatically expanded upon. And after that moment, even I got sensitive about Josuke's hair. If anybody insults that, we are taking it outside. The one thing I really wish we had gotten more of though is Josuke. For the protagonist of part four, I'd say he really didn't feel like the main character for roughly half the series. Quite often, individuals like Koichi or Rohan would take the helm for episodes and episodes on end, which I didn't mind because I love the ensemble feel of part four, and I especially enjoyed those two characters, but Josuke, I think, is the least invested Jojo so far. He was just sort of around for these events to be occurring. Like going back, Jonathan was tied directly to Dio, Joseph to the Pillarmen, and Jotaro to the task of saving his mother's life. Meanwhile, Josuke just happens to be a kid with a stand and all sorts of crazy crap happening around him with no profound driving force to really act in the series, which once again is completely fine because the slice of life business means that we can spend time with Josuke just screwing around. But in stark contrast, the episode centering on Koichi and Rohan specifically always felt like they held a lot more dramatic oomph, at least for me. I do love Josuke's stand though, crazy diamond. The moment I first saw it, I knew we were in for some insanity and it's just so hard to predict what that thing will be capable of in terms of sheer creativity. What I will say is that it did sometimes undercut a lot of the drama though, because if somebody other than Josuke got hurt, even mortally wounded, then there was almost never a sense in my mind of, oh damn, like there has been in every other part so far because well, crazy diamond is just going to fix everything, right? And for the most part, that was right. Still, I think losing that feeling was very much worth it to explore this amazingly cool stand. In fact, most of the stands in part four were actually outstanding. I actually struggled to think of one that I didn't enjoy. I mean, if I had to choose, then maybe the rat stand was a bit basic, but even then it was used nicely in an episode where Jotaro, the hero of the world, is convincingly defeated by said rat. You know, this is the man who ultimately defeated Dio, brought to the verge of death by a slightly above average intelligent rodent, which I think officially makes Rat by far the most powerful figure in Jojo to this point. Still, every stand has some wonderfully interesting abilities that are starting to border on weird and niche, which I love because the super basic stands of part three really didn't do it for me at all. Well, for the most part anyway. There were some great ones, mostly not. However, things like Harvest, The Lock, and Superfly are all kinds of weird, strange, but incredibly potent and hold a ton of fun use if implemented creatively. Kind of like how Nen abilities are generally treated in Hunter x Hunter. And yes, I'm very much starting to see how Jojo would have profoundly inspired Togashi in regards to that. But something else I really loved about part four was the setting. Morio is a strange, strange town, unlike anything I have ever seen portrayed in the medium of animation before. And I was especially taken in by the color palette of it actually, because seriously, anything that can make a shot dominated by baby shit brown into an aesthetically appealing setting is pure genius. 
Part four really has very much expanded my thoughts on color theory, that's for sure. But there was a lot to get invested into here as well as the time to actually do so as well. Unlike the first three parts, which are marked by near consistent travel. You never get to really know a location like we do with Morio, and I think I'm going to very much miss this little town going forward. Plus it also introduced some new concepts, at least to me in the Jojoverse, like ghosts in the form of Raimi and Arnold. A dog in the series who yes, does die, but is one of the very rare canines to achieve a sense of revenge for its murder, which was quite satisfying to see. And it was very nice to have a layer like this introduced though, because I think things do risk becoming a bit stale if every single thing happens to be explained by a stand. Also, aliens, or at the very least the possibility of aliens with Mikitaka. I'm both heavily intrigued and highly annoyed that that was never explored further, because yeah, this is one of those things that could probably be explained by a stand, but at the same time, aliens in the Jojoverse would be something that I would be very interested in. Something I was slightly disappointed in was how Joseph was used in part four though, or rather, not used. I was really excited when I found out that he was arriving in Morio, and even if he was somewhat old and senile, I was hoping that he would actually be relevant in some way, shape or form. But in the end, all he really did was become involved with the invisible baby, which I'm going to assume is important in future parts. Sort of like the baby popping up in the end of part one, because otherwise they spent an awful lot of time bringing the old man here and focusing on an invisible baby for no real reason. Now moving on to something very important that I haven't touched on yet, Yoshikage Kira. Hands down, the best Jojo antagonist thus far. I mean, don't get me wrong, I love Dio, but he has a really flat sense of evil for the sake of evil that never really captivated me. But Kira is a legitimately intriguing figure who doesn't want anything so grand as to take over the world, but instead he just wants to live a relatively quiet life unnoticed by the world and is a highly introverted individual, which is a feeling that I can heavily identify with. I mean, less so the murdery hand fetish, but that's something else that made him weirdly disgustingly intriguing. So to bring up Dio again as a comparison, nothing he ever did really shocked me because I knew he was just a prick for the sake of being a prick. But Kira was capable of shocking me on many occasions, one of which was when he was licking the fingers of the severed hand in public, which actually made me yell out a string of no, 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 no. So loud that my wife came in and asked what was wrong. But my favorite thing about Kira is that he is a very rare breed of antagonist who doesn't take action unless he absolutely needs to. And I do enjoy that feeling of knowing that Kira will never do anything unnecessary and watching him become consistently cornered, forcing him to act once more and dig himself further and further deeper into hell. Which speaking of, the poetic justice of Kira being taken away by a legion of hands was not lost on me. Although I'm actually surprised that Kira didn't just willingly give himself up to the hundreds of hands that appeared before him. Because surely to Kira that would just be a harem of hands for all eternity, heavenly even. And as for the family that Kira, I guess, adopts, I was also surprised at how much I became attached to Hayato, because usually child characters just annoy the hell out of me, but there was some very nice heart and soul put into this kid, and having him become a major part of the series climax was a very strong narrative move in my opinion. Although there was one thing about the final conflict that like really, really pissed me off, which was when Josuke and Okiyasu were facing off against Kira, and not like 10 meters down the road were standing Koichi, Rohan, and Jotaro, just completely oblivious to the action that was going on right next to them, despite there being multiple explosions and screams. And at one stage Jotaro like thinks he notices something, but then he shrugs it off as, oh, I guess it was just the sound of the rain, despite the fact that it had long since stopped raining at this point. But more importantly, Jotaro is the kind of man who is supposed to be paranoid about every little thing. I mean, this is the man who warned Josuke not to drink any water, just on the odd possibility that the enemy stand might be related in some way to water. He thinks about every possible scenario. And in this case, he just goes, well, I guess that thing was actually nothing, which I don't buy and that part was kind of infuriating. What I do buy very much though, is that fantastic ending, which was a bit of a shock the first time I saw it because the music began and I was listening. And then I said to myself, oh, this, this sounds a lot like Savage Garden. And then the voice of Darren Hayes began singing and just, yeah, that's insane. So basically an Australian 90s pop song was certainly not what I was expecting from Jojo's Bizarre Adventure. But hey, if its mission was to invoke a sense of the 90s, then it sure as hell worked for me because I was listening to that exact song in the 90s, so nostalgia all over. I also really enjoyed that it was effectively one tracking shot straight through Morio, highlighting all of the characters that we'd met and even hiding some in some very sneaky places. Although I was really hoping that after every new story, the character or characters we'd met would be added in for us to find. But instead they seem to add the characters in in giant batches, which you know is also cool, I guess, because it's a generally fun ending. 
So overall, Diamond is Unbreakable was a hugely enjoyable experience, on par with part two, if not better for me. It is difficult to compare it with Battle Tendency though, because the genres are so radically different. I mean, if I had to choose, then maybe I'd say part four, because we got to spend more time in such a great environment. But then again, part two told its story so wonderfully and efficiently in a short amount of time, so you cannot fault it for that. I don't know, we'll see. Maybe I'll watch part five, and this will all become a moot point because that will be so damn good. And I honestly have no idea what to expect from this series at the moment. Every part is almost like a completely different world, which means that starting a new part is always going to be a gamble, especially when you found the last part so enjoyable. So in any case, it is now time for Golden Wind. And that pretty much does it for my thoughts on part four of Jojo's Bizarre Adventure. If you enjoyed this video and the content this channel produces in general, then please do consider donating to the New World Review Patreon because the support of all of you amazing people is what continues to make this channel possible. And if Patreon isn't quite your style, then please do leave this video a like, share or subscribe because it also helps support this channel an incredible amount. And if you'd like to join the fun at any time, then please do head over to my Discord server where a wide array of shenanigans takes place on a daily basis. And finally, please do comment with your thoughts on Diamond is Unbreakable. This has been the New World Review and I'll see you next time.